Good afternoon, good evening to all of you, our viewers this evening and our wonderful speakers. My name is Anna Herrhausen. I am executive director of Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft. We are a think tank and convening organization founded by Deutsche Bank almost 30 years ago. We are based in Berlin and we collaborate internationally with academic institutions and civil society organizations. More than 15 years ago, we embarked upon a global investigation into the future of cities. We did so together with a group of um, academics from the London School of Economics. You know many of these people now as the leading figures of the internationally renowned Center of Competence, LSE Cities. The investigation today is known as the Urban Age Program. Not too long ago, we felt that we had come close to discovering what one of my predecessors once called a grammar of success of cities. I know it's oversimplifying, but in essence, we said high density living and working, mass public transport, and of course, mixed communities. Those were the ingredients that we emphasized for sustainable and vibrant cities. And then of course, the pandemic happened. Social distancing replaced density. The car, again, or the bike, replaced mass public transport. And sheer need often came to be the driver of innovation, not so much proximity allowing computer scientists maybe and venture capitalists bumping into each other at after works drinks. In addition, stepping back from the immediate challenges to what many of us had come to accept as state of the art of when thinking about cities, the pandemic laid bare some of the structural flaws um, that we're grappling with in the way in which we organize our modern lives. Questions about environmental sustainability, about social equity, and about technological progress. What is it that we value? How do we express that? And how do we organize in order to preserve and nurture that? With these core questions in mind, and with a view to the aforementioned immediate challenges the pandemic poses to what we have long thought about as state of the art when state of the art when thinking about cities, Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft and LSE Cities together conceived a series of urban age debates entitled Cities in the 2020s. It is with great pleasure now that I welcome you all to this second out of five debates. The series has covered or will cover questions around the future of work, the future of mobility, or the future of commerce. Today, we're all here to talk about the significance of, the dangers to, and the potential of public space. We will talk about humanizing the city. We have a fantastic group of urban thinkers and practitioners here with us this evening. Architects Rosiana Montiel, Elizabeth Dilla, and Amanda Levite, and author Suketo Meta. Ricky Burdett of LSE Cities has the pleasure and the privilege of guiding us all through the session. So please, Ricky, 
over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anna. And uh, let me add my welcome on behalf of the LSE to the global audience, which uh, typical of an LSE event is um, now tuning in to this event. Let me spend just a few seconds on explaining how the evening is going to be organized. Um, and then we will move on to the different presentations and a longer discussion about this issue of humanizing the city. Now, the event is going to last um, uh, roughly an hour and a half left. It will end at seven o'clock uh, British summertime, which is in an hour and um, 24 minutes-ish. Um, and in the last part of it, there will be an opportunity to have questions and answers from those of you who are listening in from around the world. Now, the function for that, as many of you know, you're all now used to Zoom webinars, is to use the Q&A uh, facility at the bottom of the screen. Uh, when you do that, pretend you were in a room with three or 400 people around you, so be brief, even when you write it, and actually say who you are and what your affiliation is if you feel that's relevant. Uh, we expect from a global LSE international audience, tough questions, and I will fill them, uh, or a few of them, we'll have to select them and pass them on to the speakers in the final part of our um, talk. The session is going to be organized with three roughly 10 minute PowerPoint presentations uh, by the three speakers that again, I'll introduce very, very briefly. Um, these are the architects, Rosanna, Amanda, and Liz. Suketo, Meta, and, um, and I, and others, will join in a longer conversation, which will take us uh, for the next half an hour or so. And then, as I said before, we will have a Q&A for the last 15 minutes or so. So let me begin by just setting the context of um, the themes, which Anna has already talked about, but also the speakers. Since we're talking about humanizing the city uh, from the perspective of how space impacts on society, that's very much the central philosophical issue of LSE cities and our work at the urban age. We've asked three architects and urban designers, three architects and urban designers who work at different scales and in very, very different contexts, but they're all committed to using design to enrich people's lives. Suketo Mehta has been an observer and a commentator on how the public space of the city can either promote at one level or even frustrate human exchange and interaction. So it will be interesting to get his view on um, the comments that are made and more wider sort of speculations of what's happening to the public realm in cities in this uh, near post-pandemic phase, depending of course, where you are in the world. It's so different in different parts of the world right now. Rosanna Montiel will be the first speaker, followed by Amanda Levitt, who's based in London, and then by Liz Dinner. I will introduce them very briefly as we come to them. But I'm going to start by asking Rosanna to prepare her uh, start share with her PowerPoint presentation. Rosanna has been leading her group the Estudio de Arquitectura in Mexico City for a number of years. They've focused uh, mainly, not only, on public projects across Mexican City. She teaches at Cornell um, and will present a few projects which raise these issues of how to intervene in the social life of the city. Rosanna, over to you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to LSC and Ricky for the invitation to be part of this significant event, sharing this space with Liz, Amanda, and Suketu. What has made us be here today is the shared concern of rethinking urban spaces as places to meet and connect for humans to interact. And I think I can speak for all of us here that more than ever, we all want to gather together. In this line, I would like to share two projects which speak about the re reactivation of public space as an anchor for resilience and equity in society. These two projects seek to humanize the city. They illustrate my work methodology and summarize one of my main tasks in architecture, transforming space into place, 
which for me translates into placemaking. Placemaking is about building community, designing a place for everyone to build meaningful relationships. So I will now start with the presentation. This is Mexico City. This is the place where I live, where I work, one of the places I constantly study, from zooming out from the urban condition and social relations to zooming in into the micro object we find in the city. It is the fifth largest mega city in the world with around 22 million, including the metropolitan area. It is a continuous city that seems to never end. It intimidates us all. Expected growth worldwide will take place in urban centers. By 2030, Mexico is expected to be the eighth largest economy in the world. It is home to a multiplicity of cities. So I've redrawn my city on different layers and scales. But most importantly, I've gone out there to listen and learn from the city itself. The projects that I'm going to explain now are two among many public housing projects I have worked on in the last few years. The first one is located in Mexico City, the other one in the state of Zacatecas. They were both commissioned by Infonavit, the Institute of National Housing Fund for Workers, whose main function is to provide workers with mortgage. Throughout Mexico, housing complexes are massive. One out of four Mexicans either live or have lived in some sort of social housing. They are cities in their own right. They repeat and multiply themselves infinitely. The first project is called Common Unity. Common Unity was an intervention we did in the San Pablo Jalpa housing complex, located in a very dense and industrialized northern part of Mexico City. The unit has close to 7,000 inhabitants. Originally, it had been built as one full unit, all connected through public spaces. But when we arrived to Jalpa, we found partitions everywhere. Access had been altered by residents through walls, gates, and fences that had become a barrier to habitability. Jalpa had no free space for civic life. As you can see, people even caged their cars. These barriers were, according to them, untouchable. People thought they would bring more security, although it was the opposite. The area was incredibly insecure. So we work around them in order to make them permeable, democratic, and meaningful. We engage the community through different several side actions and workshops. Side actions is something we do all the time. They are very low cost interventions that involve the local people with their space in a ludic, innovative way. Their purpose is to get people to voice their needs and aspirations. The added value of letting people represent their own space is they become aware of the worth of what they have. So we transformed the sectors of the unit into what we termed common unity. One of our design strategies to free privatized spaces for public use was to shift the vertical, railing, walls, gates, and closures, which separate and divide for the horizontal, roof, shelter, floor patterns, and common grounds that connect, reunite, and encourage community interaction. Design spoke for itself in common unity. People, people willingly gave up 90% of the barriers. Trust was the touchstone for change. This is how we found the, the, the space and we transform it into this. The horizontal became more than just a roof. The shelter common areas we designed expanded the program of potential activities through compact multifunctional structures that invited all age groups around the clock. This project was low cost. We resignified simple materials to improve the public space. The place can be experienced today with different activities. People have, to go, have got to know each other. Children play together. There are parties. They take lessons. They do ceremonies. They screen movies at night. And adults sweep the floor and keep it clean because they care about it. The flexible boundaries made the common areas more than a front yard or a park. They bonded neighbors. There was also an old leaky shed and we transformed the same space into a shiny, shiny library called El Saloncito. So the new space facilitated a different kind of ownership and appropriation. One that habituates inhabitants to work for the common good. 
through place making, we built with the community, not only for it. Our design substitute barriers for boundaries. Place making is understanding that the value of architecture is not only laying bricks, but activating a social construction. The second project I will talk about is called Fresnillo Playground. Located exactly in the center of Mexico, the state of Zacatecas is a strategic route of one of the most powerful drug cartels in the country. Fresnillo is the second largest city in the state. It is an incredibly hot and desertic place, and it is known as one of the most fearful cities in Mexico. This housing complex of 102 buildings where the project happened is not a welcoming place. When we arrived, the aggressive colors of the buildings were intimidating. There was no vegetation, no public areas, no parks. So we were invited to design a public space for the community to gather. The housing state um, is, constantly in, uh, is constantly hugged by members of organized crime. So the social landscape is intrinsically violent. We were even provided with guards to be able to, to work. So beside the social scars inflicted upon people, this housing complex had a visible urban scar. A former, a former open air sewage canal had been paved and what remained was a dry creek dividing the unit into two. The presence of barriers was very clear. The bridge blocked the access underneath for anyone to pass and a wheelchair or a stroller could not cross it because one had to go down the stairs and then up again to use the bridge. So this exacerbated the problem of disconnection and division. We observed that children tried to slide in the rain gutters and that gave us the idea of creating playground with the slopes and transforming the blocking bridge into a new type of connection. Workshops, as always, were organized to involve people. When our main tactic was transforming this hostile border into an attractive horizon that people would feel drawn to. We made an accessible bridge that opened up an esplanade underneath. And this new bridge included games, shade, and it became the place to be. We also rebuilt the canal slopes to make them work as resting area, as agora steps, and as part of a playground program of games of stairs and slides. One of the most important things we did was to, the, to change the color of 102 buildings into an earthy and neutral color palette. As simple as it sounds, this was a radical change that made people feel they were living in a different place, safer and more welcoming. So unclaimed urban spaces can be transformed into inclusive places rich in function diversity. Places of resilience where despite the surrounding violence, Young people like Lalo can teach their dance classes. This talented dancer might never be able to leave Fresnillo, but this place has given him hope, joy, and an opportunity to share his talents and become a leader. Today, there are more than 100 kids playing there every day. It's become an active playground. Play has become essential to reduce insecurity and violence. When you, when you really observe the topography of a place, you can immediately find possibilities to transform a disused urban space and resignify it with little resources. This is how scarcity becomes abundance. What I just talked about, freeing space to generate community, is for me a way of place making. And not only that, but also city making. My learnings from do doing these projects result in seven principles that contribute in humanizing the city that I'd like to share to conclude. We must seek content in context, change barriers into boundaries, start with a shift of perception, approach the landscape as the program, resignify materials, work with temporality, and hold beauty as a basic right. The city is humanized when the space becomes a place. Thank you very much. Rosanna, uh, I think we all appreciated that very, very succinct description of very complex um, project. Uh, I just want to ask you one thing. We'll talk later about this very important phrase that you've used a couple of times and even wrote up, which is you're going from what is a barrier, into, uh, impermeable barrier into a porous 
border. And we'll, we'll talk about that because I think it cuts across many of the projects. In other words, a physical thing that has social impact, right? We'll talk about that. But can you just say something about how did these projects emerge? Who, who was the client? Who came to you? How did that happen? Sure. So both of these projects were commissioned by Infonavit. As I said before, Infonavit is the Institute of the National Funding uh, for Workers. Fund, they fund housing for workers. So um, it was the former director, Carlos Cedillo, he invited many architects, different architects to participate. And the brief was, how can we rehabilitate a series of old housing complexes, um, which were in really bad shape? and how can we provide them, them with public spaces? So uh, for us, it was really, really important to understand very deeply what we were assigned and how we would do it. So um, first, at the beginning, we were told that we could not get into San Pablo Jalpa, for example, because they didn't know if we were gonna build it. So for us, it was really important to search content in context. So we went, um, undercover as sociologists. And um, I think that we are also sociologists as architects, no? so we, that's one of our personas. So uh, how to do it in a creative way and engaging with people was very important. But uh, I, I think that we as architects, we have to work with people, we have to listen very carefully, but after we have, we as architects have the vision to give them more. So we always try to give more in our projects. So okay. if they ask for a roof, we give them more. If they we'll ask- come, Rosanna, we'll come back to some of these um, bigger issues that you raised there, but very significant that, that the client in a way also recognized that the physical impairment needed to be fixed. Now, Amanda Levite is, um, as I said, based in the UK, runs a large practice that is working internationally. I've known her for a very long time, and I know that she's been fiercely committed, fiercely committed to innovation and public debate about these issues. So uh, she's going to talk about a couple of um, projects which she's completed, and one important new idea about um, giving life to the center of the city. Amanda, so if you're able to, could you move now to the presentation? Thank you. Well, th thank you, Ricky, and I'm really, really delighted to be in this company. And Rosanna, I loved your presentation. And Ricky, thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to show you, first of all, two museums where arguably the urban moves that we made were more important than the architectural ones. This is the mat in Lisbon on the Tagus River. It's where the great explorers set off. And we wanted to capture that very outward looking characteristic of the city. And yet Lisbon is cut off from its waterfront by train tracks and a highway. And so our first move was to persuade our client, the energy company EDP, that we also needed to design a bridge to the other side of the railway tracks in order to connect the museum back to the city. And we identified a small square on the other side where we could span over the road without any need for steps and then land on the roof of the museum. And with this really quite simple move, which actually became the generator for the entire design, we not only helped reconcile a city whose waterfront was cut off, but we created a new public space on the roof. And at the opening weekend, more than 80,000 people, that's 14% of the population of Lisbon, congregated on the roof and along the riverfront. And it's now one of the most visited museums in Portugal. And it is in effect a privately funded public building. This elevated square, which is in fact the roof of the museum, is now part of the Riverside Walk. It's a destination and it's a wonderful vantage point to just look across the water. But maybe more importantly, to be able to look 
backwards to the city and give you a completely new perspective of the urban context. But I think it's perhaps what we didn't do that is as important as what we did do. And untypically for an architect, we did not build as high as we could have done. I mean, and maybe it's counterintuitive. We had to sink the gallery spaces, some of them below the water table. But by designing a low slum building, we preserved what is important. And that is the views from the city to the water and the views from the other side of the river back to the city. Our focus was very much on the riverfront, making places to sit close to the water with steps that go down literally into the river, and then steps closer to the museum where you can take shade from the roof. And there's this magic moment at the top of the steps, and I, I wish we could say we designed it, but we didn't. We just kind of discovered it. But when you stand below the overhang of the roof, you can literally hear the sound of the waves reflected above you. And there is another unexpected moment that we simply could not have imagined when a group of musicians used the ceramic tiles of the facade as a musical instrument. So moving to my hometown, London, and the Victorian Albert Museum, the original way into the museum is a rather grand entrance on Cromwell Road, which is a very busy traffic artery that runs east-west. With this project, our task was to design a second entrance off Exhibition Road that runs north-south, as well as a vast space for the museum's headline shows. Exhibition Road is the home not just to the V&A, but to other museums, to Imperial College and the Royal Albert Hall. And it had been newly pedestrianized, but there was nowhere to step off the main drag of the street. We saw a really fantastic opportunity here, which was to renegotiate the relationship between the museum and the street by taking the street into the museum and taking the museum out onto the street. But to do this, we had to overcome literally a huge barrier. This stone screen, which faces onto Exhibition Road, was a very important part of the museum's heritage. It was originally designed to hide the boiler rooms, but they've long since gone. And we took a very big risk when we did the competition. We argued that the success of this project was dependent on a radical alteration to this grade one listed screen, because its purpose was no longer to hide, but to reveal. And when we won the competition, we had to then make this same argument to the planners and the heritage bodies and persuade them that the social imperative of access in both a literal and metaphorical way overrode the conservation arguments. We did succeed and the, the screen is now repurposed, if you like, as a colonnade. And it was this move that unlocked the potential of the project because it creates a new courtyard and allows you just to drift in off the street. We put a cafe in the sun, which you can see on the left, and we persuaded the museum to open the cafe outside of museum hours to better connect it with the city. And it's really an altogether more informal, very different way of entering a museum. In the foreground, you can see the oculus, which looks down into the gallery that we designed below ground, which is the very raison d'etre of this project. And the repurposed screen now opens up a completely new view of the street. The way that the public use the courtyard has been transformative. It's changed the way people see the museum and it's changed also the way the institution see themselves. And just like in Lisbon, 
it's sometimes the things that you don't do that allow the unexpected to happen. And that's why we did not clutter the courtyard with all the paraphernalia that goes with a, an entrance and why we kept it as flat as possible so that it could be appropriated by the public. And then to just let the life of the city into the museum. Now this courtyard is owned by the museum, but it very much belongs to the public. And since the new entrance was opened, visitor numbers at the v and and I'm talking pre-pandemic, were up 23%. And this was at a time when visitor numbers to museums in London were in decline. And I think that really speaks of the value of creating public urban space in a cultural context. Now, what is much more of a challenge, and it's a challenge that I want to take on, is how do we do this in the commercial sector where retail has been ravaged by the accelerated shift to online shopping? This is Oxford Street in London, once London's flagship um, retail destination. But the perfect storm of the pandemic, combined with a trend for online shopping, has forced many stores and many department stores to close, leaving vast shipwrecks of buildings in the high street and a huge loss of jobs. But the department store used to be a very important part of the community and part of community life. These buildings, they hold collective memories, they have historic significance and they're extremely well built. And yet many are threatened with demolition to make way for office blocks. And this just feels wrong. And do we really need more office blocks right now? But these are very difficult buildings to repurpose because they lack daylight and they are very deep in plan that makes them very difficult to easily convert. But we want to find a way of bringing them back to life. At the end of the 19th century, Emile Zola wrote beautifully about the department store as a metaphor for modern urban life, as a whole way of being. And I want to see if we can reimagine a new way of being within the shell of a vacant department store and make it a place of discovery and community again. We've taken as an example, the now defunct House of Fraser department store on Oxford Street, but it could be any store on any high street. And we've been thinking about what kind of activities could animate this somewhat problematic space and make it attractive and exciting to today's public. And in this project, we want to question the nature of public space inside buildings. Can we speak to community values, not just through design, but through the very programming within buildings? Our first thought here is to open up the ground floor and create a through route as a food market with stools where you can eat together. And we've begun to imagine growing a community around the theme of food, because food brings people together, because integrating the urban and nature has never been more important. And because there are really exciting developments in urban farming that speak to the next generation and their hopes and their values. So here we can display some of this, cultivate and share in a way that delights and inspires with hydroponic farming, growing food vertically without the need for sunlight, growing mushrooms in the basement, research and education spaces at the edges, and of course, a fabulous roof garden. This is really just the very beginning of a project, but I hope it speaks to the topic of today's discussion and, and the potential for creating new social typologies that capture the mood and the character of our time. Thank you.
Amanda, uh, thanks very much. And again, very interesting to see that a number of concepts about what is impermeable becoming permeable, what is perceived as being private or belonging to a museum becomes part of the city. I know Suketu has written about and will probably comment about the issue of appropriation. You mentioned that word, whose space is it and, and how is it used? But can you just uh, comment briefly on the first two projects, because I think we'll pick up the big issues you've raised about bringing life back into the street in a moment in the bigger discussion. How difficult was it to, uh, in a way, go outside of the classic brief of um, a museum, which is about galleries and all that? And, and again, not unlike my question to Rosanna, you know, did you have a client that was um, um, already attuned? But probably more importantly, in terms of this bigger debate of where cities are going in the 2020s, do you, do you feel that this discussion of greater integration of institutions, of uh, housing and, and more is getting easier? I'm not sure whether it's getting easier, but I think it's becoming more understood. And I think there are really interesting, I think there's a kind of appetite for interesting public-private par public partnerships. And I think that's definitely what you will need in the commercial sector. But you know, in the in the case of Lisbon, we had a very visionary client in the um, the CEO of EDP who completely, you know, when we proposed that the the success of the museum was dependent on a bridge, he was completely supportive, and we presented to the city who were also very supportive and delighted to have a bridge that was being paid for by an energy company. In fact, the, the mayor who we presented to at the time is now the prime minister of um, Portugal. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's not, I don't think it's about easy or not easy. I think it's our responsibility as architects to spark these conversations, to provoke debate about this kind of thing and maybe you know bring the private sector and the public sector together well you've started you've provoked us already with the discussion about what to do with um, redundant department stores so we'll come back to that um liz is a partner in dealer scofidio and renfro and with uh, her partner ricardo and now other partners has been responsible for some for me the most provocative and effective public projects in many cities of course uh, in New York, Moscow, we'll see some of those projects um, in a moment, but also Milan, LA, London. Um, at the moment, smaller projects are not a bigger project we hope we would have had, which was the music center near the Barbican, uh, but that for the moment is on hold. I think one of the things that distinguishes Liz's approach, and we'll hear that in a moment, is this complete commitment, not unlike the previous two speakers, to um, innovation, experimentation, and practice, and sort of putting the two together. So, Liv, if um, your technology is working, can I ask you to talk about some of the projects that deal with this notion of humanizing the city? Okay, very good. Um, so, it's it's. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I could say, Amanda, I've been to two of your projects, and I could attest to their success. And uh, I have yet to see Rosanna's. Um, uh, I'm going to just start by saying that the work of, of my studio has always been guided by the principle that urban space is public and democratic like air and water uh, until it is cut up and privatized as, uh, uh, as property. And it's up to us, we're responsible, I think all of us, to protect the public realm and uh, especially um, now under threat of uh, regimes, uh, are, regimes that, you know, that might uh, um, actually suppress our uh, desire to, uh, you know, to express ourselves, but also um, it's under threat uh, by greed, developer greed. And so um, I want to show uh, two projects today. Um, the first is the High Line, which uh, I think many people know, but I will just say some things about it. Um, it is uh, now 17 years in the making. Um, and it's a transformation of a 1.5 mile stretch of obsolete urban infrastructure, industrial infrastructure, 
uh, into a linear park. And uh, um, this is the way we found it. Um, and after the 1980s, uh, it sat derelict. Um, and in a neighborhood that looked like this. Um, and the idea was, you know, to take uh, this, this uh, a piece of property, which was unused, and bring green space uh, into an area that was really underserved by green space, but also with an argument uh, to serve as a catalyst. Um, because in this area, all the property owners and developers uh, really felt that this rusting piece of infrastructure devalued their properties. So the High Line um, has now been open fast forward for uh, a number of years. Uh, in 2009, it opened its first uh, uh, chunk and it continued to grow. Many people have visited the High Line and I think it might be really familiar to you. Um, I think one of the things that really worked was the defamiliarization of the city from uh, the point of view of uh, 25 feet in the air. And um, in, a, in a sort of culture that uh, feeds on uh, work all the time and consuming every second of the day, this was an area to really do nothing. You know, we're sitting and, uh, and strolling. A, a very new idea to urbanites uh, was reintroduced. Um, and since uh, the Highline has been used for lots of things, uh, people discover it and um, uh, bird watching and um, education and dancing and, and music and films and, uh, and so forth. And so it um, has become incredibly um, popular to New Yorkers. Um, and what was not envisioned initially was that a place that was originally imagined to serve maybe 400,000 people a year, um, pre-pandemic um, had 8 million uh, visitors per year, more than all of these other sort of tourist destinations uh, all over uh, uh, New York. And um, the High Line also went viral uh, so cities across six continents were inspired uh, by the High Line to turn their obsolete infrastructure into public space. And this is from London to Paris and Tokyo, Seoul, Jerusalem, Mexico City, M Mumbai, um, just <laughs> the world over. And um, this was dubbed as the High Line effect after the Bilbao effect. And uh, even the transformation of highways, you know, with uh, on weekends um, with AstroTurf and uh, people just sort of starting to hang out, uh, starting to hang out. And um, this really became a phenomenon. Um, as a result of the Highline fever, we were invited into an international competition to create a park in Moscow, the first new park in 50 years and on a historically charged site in Moscow, next door to St. Basil's Cathedral and Red Square and the Kremlin, right by the river. Um, and this was, uh, I'll just go back a moment. This is uh, on the footprint of a Khrushchev era hotel called the Rosia Hotel. Um, and it was the largest one, uh, 3000 rooms. But we had a moral dilemma. Should we work in a country under a repressive regime? Uh, well, you know, we convinced ourselves that this project was for Muscovites uh, and it wasn't to represent the regime. Um, despite the rigid, uh, the frigid relations between US and Russia at the time, uh, the speculation was that an, Amer an American firm could never win this competition on such an important site. Uh, we won, somehow we won. And <clears throat> unlike uh, formal parks in Russia uh, with axial uh, movement and a limited uh, selection of official plants and restricted access to vegetation, Zaryaje Park was designed for people to interact with nature. And this is the plan we call this uh, wild urbanism. And um, it's a kind of hybrid park in which hardscape and landscape, topography and buildings are intertwined 
into a new type of public space. And against the competition brief, which requested no large areas for people to congregate, obviously next to the Kremlin, um, we made large sweeping areas for people to come together. It's amazing that we won this competition. Um, the site was leveled, totally leveled, and we built a topography from it. Uh, you could see here, uh, uh, looking in one direction, uh, uh, some of the, the landscape and the hardscape, there's a crust, a glass crust over a hill that we've made, which is the roof of, a, uh, 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 of, of the new Philharmonic Hall, which we didn't do. An, an area where a uh, kind of boomerang goes very close to the river over a very large uh, highway where the, the river is inaccessible. And we tucked lots of buildings and program into the topography. Under the crust, uh, a big uh, area, this is working with augmented uh, climate where open air, uh, the grass uh, actually um, grows uh, in, uh, and, and survives in the winter. Uh, this is an, a visitor that came by at the beginning. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, fortunately, the project was not overly politicized and we were spared. The first, um, uh, uh, the, the park was surprisingly uh, popular, one million visitors in the first month. And you could see some of the, uh, some of the images here. Uh, and you could see that there is a, you know, a, an invitation for the public to come in and, um, and, and use the, the public space in a kind of uninhibiting way, very, very different from other Moscow parks. Um, then we, um, after this sort of great success and we were lauded, then all of a sudden came press about how this park has promoted uh, sexual activities in the park. And we were, um, we were really uh, kind of surprised and we felt like, wow, this is a success. Uh, people are feeling so free in the space that they can really enjoy the space and each other. So to us, it was a victory. Um, and also um, it became a national stamp and you know, somehow were absorbed and, uh, mm -hmm. and nevertheless, you know, an international group coming in uh, very much appreciated. Um, so freedoms in coming back to the high line freedoms uh, of um, sort of expressing uh, uh, love and, and, you know, like a very amorous uh, place as it turned out. But there was another unexpected uh, effect of so coming back to the high line. Um, and this is um, the city's uh, initial investment of 115 million stimulated over five billion dollars of urban development in the surrounding neighborhoods. And the High Line was essentially a tipping point in the growth of the far west side. Once considered an eyesore that devalued adjacent property, the High Line ignited a feeding frenzy for developers. Um, so far more than anyone had, uh, had imagined, this success and ultimately gentrification came faster um, than, than we could have uh, uh, predicted. The cheapest real estate became the most expensive real estate in New York. And you could see some of these headlines here. Um, so after seeing this rapid change, we asked ourselves, what is the measure of success for the architectural catalyst? And can the catalyst fall victim to its own success? What are the ethics of entering into an, an, entering into an, al an altering uh, a city's life cycle? What is the responsibility of the architect in shaping the aftermath of urban change that they didn't quite predict? And what would we have done anything differently than, uh, than we did uh, now, knowing, uh, you know, at, at that point, knowing what, knowing what we know now? And I would just want to show you just a couple of slides of this post um, occupancy project, which is our response to our, some of our own questions, um, which is to take the High Line as a platform for an urban stage. Um, we created uh, what we called the Mylong Opera. And looking at the past and looking at this alienating future, um, you know, uh, it's, a, it's just a hard look um, at uh, uh, where we are. So this is called a biography of seven o'clock. And um, it situated 1000 singers along the 1.5 miles of the High Line. Um, most of these 40 uh, choirs 
uh, non-professional uh, singers, so and 250 professional singers, so 1,000 in all. And um, you can see maybe just some of these images and hear a little bit of the sound. No grocery store around here anymore. No place to get your shoes. Okay, so the public um, navigates uh, this site and, uh, um, and interacts very, very clo in close proximity to 1,000 um, uh, New Yorkers. Um, and um, I have to say in closing, I'm, I'm late, um, but there was a palpable sense of citizenship um, and shared values in this piece. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. And I think you've managed to certainly uh, give all of us who are watching uh, a sense of um... The, the the importance of this intervention. I mean, you called it loud urbanism. I've never heard that term before, but uh, the question I had in mind, which I think we'll also bring in Suketo in a second, is that um, the fact that you're, you, you didn't in a way know what the consequences would be. You talked about these two extremes of unintended consequences. Um, and in many ways, you know, Suketo has written a lot about uh, the best thing uh, a public space can do is not determine everything, right? It's actually, uh, let's see what the hell happens. That's quite good. And I think you, you reacted to that, but also say just a little bit more as a designer, where do you, where do you stop short? What do, do, do you, is it good that something is not finished? That in a way society or the organization the world that then occupies that environment uh, in a way takes over. I know you've thought about that too. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a way as a designer, you have to imagine how something is used, how it's going to be interpreted. And, um, you know, I think about our projects very uh, cinematically as events, um, as places to inhabit, but of course you can't uh, define the way people use these spaces. and. Uh, very often they're um, used, they're abused, and sometimes they're used in novel ways that you could have never expected, much more rich than you would have expected. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible to not, to design without imagining, um, you know, the finality of the project and, and, uh, and uh, the public engagement of it. But in a sense, it's just like giving the car keys to the kids, you know? I mean, it's like, that's it, it's yours, it's your, it's your life. Um, and, it, you know, when you finish the project, um, um, one has to expect, and if it's a good project and if it's successful, that it will live on um, beyond your control in, in positive ways that you can't imagine. Suketo, let me bring you in. I mean, all these discussions make me think of one word, which is complexity. But, you know, where, where there is complexity or layers of complexity in the th projects that we've seen six or seven up on now, success maybe is measured by complexity. You've written about that. In particular, you did a wonderful piece with Michael Kimmelman in the New York Times uh, really quite recently uh, during the pandemic, where you did a, a virtual walk through one of your favorite, uh, very mixed neighborhoods in, in, in New York City, the wider New York City, Jackson Heights, where you talked about one space, which happens to be called Diversity Plaza, I think. So, I mean, it's a, maybe it was named uh, after the event. But can you uh, give us your reflections on the, you know, the, the importance of public space in, I guess, promoting rather than frustrating this level of diversity and complexity? Uh, thank you, Ricky, and, and uh, thank you to the presenters for these um, really uh, thought-provoking presentations uh, for their work. Um, Diversity Plaza, to answer your question, is a little patch of ground right outside the subway in Jackson Heights in the borough of Queens in New York, uh, where I grew up when I came from Bombay to New York. And Diversity Plaza was a project uh, one of the prime movers was Janet Sadiq Khan, the then trans, uh, Commissioner of Transportation. She basically 
blocked off a small stretch of road and made it a pedestrian plaza. Now, Jackson Heights really lacks for any kind of public space. There aren't any big parks. There aren't even small parks. And uh, this is a space now. Uh, it's just got a few benches. Really, nothing much has been done to it. But if you want to know what's happening with the Bangladeshi elections or um, relationships between Tibetans and Chinese, um, you can go to Diversity Plaza and find little groups of immigrants. Jackson Heights is arguably uh, the most diverse neighborhood in the country. And you find these people debating the politics of their homelands. And you can pick up stories of these people uh, as they're here. So it's an incredibly human space in the big city. And the challenge for cities like New York or Mumbai or London going forward is after the pandemic, we're on a stricken and riven planet. So in the last year, um, in the cities that I've been to, I mean, I'm in New York right now, um, I've seen a level of anger that I haven't ever. People are furious and they're also, the world is more grotesquely unequal than ever before. Uh, Jeff Bezos in the last year increased his wealth by $64 billion. He's now worth $177 billion. So the great problem facing cities before the pandemic was gentrification. It didn't matter how beautiful the cities were, how visionary the projects were, if you couldn't afford to live there. Um, and in the last year, what we've seen is cities have become public spaces for social justice movements. Um, where I now uh, in Manhattan, in Greenwich Village, um, the streets were ringing with declarations that Black Lives Matter, um, people were out in the streets, uh, people of all races. But what we've also seen now is that language itself seems to have splintered. Um, architects talk in a particular kind of language, sociologists talk in a different language, writers talk in a different language. You know, uh, you referred to the post-pandemic phase um, at the beginning of the presentation. And my social media feed is, is filled with um, selfies of people celebrating in New York. Um, you go out to Brooklyn, you go to Manhattan, people are on the streets, they're eating, they're reuniting with friends and family they haven't seen for a year. And at the same time, from my friends and family in Delhi, in Mumbai, I'm seeing images of a charnel house. Um, tens of thousands of Indians are dying every day. The hospitals are full, the funeral homes are full. And the government's response is, um, they're going full steam ahead on a project called Central Vista, which is going to remake Delhi, a $3 billion project, a kind of vanity project for the Modi government. And it's been declared an essential service. So, it's an example of how not to humanize a city. Now, if I can pick, pick up on, on this point, because it, it seems to me that many of the uh, initiatives that actually have been presented today, but many of the things you, Suketo, are critical about, including this you know, top-down anodyne generic vision for yet another uh, uh, city of the 21st century, right? Always succeed in doing at least two or three things. One is that they become soulless, uh, they are completely uh, deterministic in sort of their day-to-day -day experiences. Um, and the third thing, they become unused. They become simplified. Uh, uh, I think uh, Richard Sennett used the word, you know, they become stupefied uh, in, in the sense. And Rosanna, I was, I was wondering on, on this notion of having to, in a way, fix things. Many of the projects that you are involved in um, are about retrofitting something that is there and that was made by a previous generation of architects, probably well-intended, but trying to sort of put them together and I think, uh, or fix them. I mean, I think Amanda's project with the department store and, um, and obviously the High Line itself are also examples of using uh, something to do something else. Um, and I was just interested if any of you, but Rosanna, maybe you start, uh, picking up this notion of complexity and, and different patterns of behavior, how does the arrangement of the space make a difference? 
Absolutely. Thank you. So um, thank you, Amanda. I really like the idea of refurbishing these commercial uh, spaces. We did a project in the studio where um, these buildings, there are 22 buildings connected to the subway stations. It's a network of networks in Mexico City and they're underused. They're abandoned, many of them. They use like one floor and there are 22 buildings, imagine in the center of Mexico City that were, um, they're iconic, they're identical and they're used to connect the, the, the subway stations. And they're there. So we propose this idea of why don't we transform these buildings into social spaces with, with new programming. And we have talked with the government and all, all, all the time. And, and we have had like, everyone is excited about the project, but then we go and there are many bureaucratic things that stop it from going. No? And then we can see that all these buildings that are there, that are derelict, how can we really find this way in transforming and using them? So I think that these ideas, even that they're not built, to put them in, the, in, you know, like here to comment about them or how, I think that there are many, many spaces that are already there and we just have to shift our perception of how to use them to revitalize the cities in a different way. And I think that the three of us have shown this type of ideas and projects of maybe like, showing how we can do architecture in a different way. Amanda. I'm not, I think what I, you know, why I enjoy working on existing buildings is because there's a kind of uh, a built-in resistance, which you need to respond to. And in, in, a, in a sense that creates complexity without it, without you having to, invent it and it creates diversity. I, I also think there's a, an absolute obligation now to reduce the amount of demolition. If we, you know, because it's polluting, it's wasteful, if we can um, repurpose and adapt existing buildings, I think it is, it, it feels the right thing to do. But I'm, I am interested in this idea of complexity, but I, I think an, an existing structure gives you that resistance. And, and for me as an architect, I find that really important. Where, where I find it very challenging is where, when you get given a more of a kind of greenfield site and it's very difficult to begin to know how to construct the, the narrative. Liz, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, um, I, always, I always feel that, um, you know, we're not, I never enter a tabula rasa, even at a, at a green, greenfield site. Like there's, oh, there's someone that's been through here before, some logics that have been there before. Um, I think that particularly now, um, we do have a responsibility to rethink old things with new logics and to actually conceive new things with open logics for an unknown future, you know, and not to be locked in maybe, you know, in. And, and in a way um, that, the, that we've built, you know, in the past, buildings that are dedicated to particular functions typologically, um, you know, that make it very hard to adapt to um, a, a future that's changing faster than we could actually produce and make architecture and, you know, root buildings into the ground. Architecture is so slow. It's so geofixed and society is changing so fast. So what, you know, how can you think forward in terms of uh, building? And I, I guess, you know, it's how can you imagine architecture of distinction without generic form going forward? But I do think that, you know, we have a lot of materials at our disposal, a lot of spaces at our disposal, and that's our first obligation. Uh, just to remind the audience that um, now is the time to, uh, I know you have already uh, put forward some q and A's so that in the last um, uh, minutes before we close, we can field some of those questions. So keep, keep them coming and send them on to the Q&A. Suket, I wonder whether you again wanted to comment on that, but also um, connect this, you know, you, you were pretty clear a moment ago about your, uh, you know, heavy criticism of how national governments effectively can affect 
the, the, the spaces of the city and whether uh, a level of democratic engagement can happen or not. Where do you feel design fits into that? And I mean, you've talked about that basically nationalism can shut down borders. And, you know, we, we, the, the, those words resonate, of course, with uh, recent developments in, in, in the countries that are represented here. Can you say more about that? Sure. So um, it's not just governments that can take off cities. Um, the High Line is a wonderful project. Um, and I remember walking on the High Line the day it uh, opened and feeling this, I was seeing my city again with this wonderful perspective. But then the High Line leads to Hudson Yards, which it seemed like a piece of Dubai blasted off into space and landed on the west side of Manhattan. And there's a giant shopping mall there whose sole purpose, it seems to me, is to make you feel poor the moment you walk in. Uh, so members of the public are invited to come out and walk up this vessel uh, and then throw themselves off it. Um, the, uh, the Hudson Yards um, is for me everything that New York shouldn't be. Um, there's another space in the borough of Queens, which people, um, very few people are aware of. It's a project, it's another um, uh, rail line and uh, I'd love to take any of you for walking there. It's a three and a half mile long uh, track, uh, which right now is like the Garden of Eden, but with graffiti. And there's a group of people who want to transform it into a Queens version of the High Line. And I think one of the problems we have in the cities across the world is that we concentrate in, in, uh, when we're thinking of uh, public space and public art uh, where the rich live and the rest of the city when the suburbs and the experts also uh, deserve this kind of um, humanizing um, the talents of our best architects and planners. And unfortunately, uh, right now they seem to be located where the money is. So at Hudson Yards in New York and Central Vista in uh, Delhi are examples of what not to do. Diversity Plaza in Jackson Heights seems to me is um, an example of what to do. More than ever, we need to think of how to humanize three places. The bazaar, which is the, the shopping mall that uh, Amanda re, uh, envisioned, uh, the, uh, the park or the playground, um, and the library. Libraries are, uh, as Eric Kleinenberg has pointed out, uh, palaces for the people. Um, so I think in the post-pandemic world, we were greater than ever need for us to connect. Um, but if recent events are any guide, uh, we're, we're going very fast in the other direction. Can I mean, just to change tone a little bit, you know, given our audience is uh, not going to be all designers, uh, given the Urban Age uh, project, very much will cover people who are involved in public policy, uh, academia, and much else. You know, there is a, a strong view that um, sociability, well-being in cities is not anything to do with the environment they live in, but to do with their, their health, to do with uh, their wealth, uh, to do with their social bonds and much else. And it would, it would be interesting to hear at this moment in time where there's been so much in, intensification of the urban experience because we've not been able to go there, right? Whether any of you feel that that um, sort of relationship between the, the world of the social and the world of physical has actually become more apparent. I mean, just like Liz, you were saying, you're 25 feet up and you see the city in a different way. Are we seeing a sort of opening up of these discourses? Liz? Um, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure what, what the question is, but I can just tell you, you know, there's a, <clears throat> I think we're, <clears throat> excuse me, all computing um, a post-pandemic world right now. And it's, you know, um, it's very difficult to actually, you know, imagine and make conclusions, but <clears throat> to tell you my own sort of personal experience uh, was a week ago re-entering my New York that I remember, but it was um, a very, very slow re-entry um, to a public event in the middle of the night, you know, and, um, and very, very carefully 
um, starting to re-enter a city that I helped to make, you know, parts of the city that I helped to make and seeing them in a very unfamiliar way for the first time. And I think um, there is, you know, as we slowly start to reawaken and hopefully trust uh, medicine and science and and the fate of cities and the fate and, and, and that cities are actually important and density counts, you know, it's something that six foot, you know, distance actually started to um, get us away from notions of density. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's going to be slow, but, uh, uh, and I think some of us will have been changed forever, but it's, it's um, I think, you know, there's, an, there's a need to help um, sort of bring us back to a semblance of urban uh, life as we knew it. And it's gonna happen very slowly. I'm going to, uh, Rosanna or Amanda, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, th there's just a, a, a couple of things. I mean, I think what the, the pandemic has really shown us is a kind of greater, or made us aware of it, to have a, how important it is to have a greater appreciation of the small things, whether that's finding that little bit of sunlight to sit outside your front door, whether it's watching a neighbor's flowers grow at the front. It, you know, the, and how important it is to bring nature closer to our cities. I mean, I would just maybe question you, Liz, about density because you, yes, density counts, but there's a limit to density. And, and who's, you know, how do we, how do we understand what is the right density and when it gets too much? You know, if you look at um, housing standards, particularly in London, but I mean, it's, it's the same throughout the world, social housing standards, but the spaces, they are too small and there is not enough outside space. That, you know, when you have such density that, that you only have a finite amount of land, things are gonna get smaller and smaller. And I'm not, I don't believe that's the right way to go. But Rosanna, isn't your project in common unity all about that? I mean, these are highly dense environments with tiny apartments, mm -hmm. and therefore the investment was made in the space in between. Exactly. So the idea is like, it's not just your apartment, but how do you extend this apartment into public space? And then how can you do many of the activities that you could do inside, but just going outside? But I think one, one of the things that, to continue the idea of, of the pandemic, I think that what we have seen, for example, we have tried many times in Mexico to take out to the streets, the restaurants, just that, no? just as simple as that. And th there was a law that, no, you could not go into the street, you could not go into the sidewalk or, sidewalk or just at some point. And today we see all the restaurants outside. So now, you know, like this uh, private, um, yeah, the private restaurants or private things are coming outside because of a necessity to be outside. So I think that this is an opportunity to take this idea of bringing the inside to the outside and changing the idea of how we use the street and how we use the sidewalks and how we use this. Rosanna, spaces. I have a question for you from the public, but uh, what you just said about the, the, the pavements, I think uh, Suketo, you said very recently that actually all these eateries, all these restaurants, particularly in the posh areas of New York City, have stopped gentrification in its tracks. I thought that was an interesting idea, but let, let, we might want to go back. So there's a question from Teresa, Maria Teresa Sanchez to Rosanna, which is what type of approach did you use in your field work con uh, or consulting with the residents? Was it human centered or did you use other approaches? And that's a sort of not dissimilar question to Liz from Ben Smith. Do architects designing public space, uh, well, it's not, it's not, it's a different question. Uh, try to um, resist design, do architects designing public space try to resist surveillance? Is it a true public space if it's covered in, by CCTV or over please to keep the area clean? And I think one of the implications behind that is, you know, who are you listening to in terms of your, but Rosanna, maybe you can answer that question first. Sure. So, um, well, we, we like to do, as I said before, this type of side actions that are very low cost, very simple, very ephemeral. 
that we have done a lot of them. I, like, there's like just going with a chalk and tracing some things in the floor. And this changed the perception of people of, of what they have of their space. So this starts to begin with a, um, an engagement of them of being curious about what's going to happen. And also we work with these map queries that are more um, qualitative than quantitative. So the idea of just going with them and asking, where did you give your first kiss? Where do you smoke your first cigarette? Or going engaging with different uh, questions. Uh, somebody was saying to me, we have to ask the right questions in order to have like all this information that can inform after the project. So doing this um, in a qualitative way and engaging, it, it completely gives you a different answer if you're just asking quantitative or in, or in data-based um, questions. So I think that this was really important for the project. Liz. Um, yeah, that question that was for me uh, is an absolutely thorny question. Um, it's, you know, typically places that are out of sight um, can be abused and therefore they become uh, perhaps a bit dangerous. And that's why, you know, all eyes on, you know, has sort of become a, a sort of a, a thing where, where you can see it, you know, it's out in the air, it's out in the open and people don't abuse. But I actually believe that uh, one can design public space of different uh, uh, qualities, um, different scales, uh, sp sca uh, sp uh, spaces of intimacy that are not, you know, within public uh, view. And, you know, I showed a little bit of that in Zariadje, although the cameras came out, you know, it's true. Um, but I, I believe that if you design good quality space, people won't abuse it and therefore um, you know, uh, it, it will remain safe and therefore not surveilled, I hope. I do want to say one thing to Amanda, you know, just about the density thing, because I, you know, there, the, every city is different and New York has emptied out. New York is thinned out beyond belief. And many of my um, uh, uh, members of my studio have moved away. And, you know, what my fear is that, you know, as we spoke about before the pandemic, um, more and more populations will be in cities and cities are getting uh, denser and denser, you know, way over 50% before the uh, pandemic uh, of people live in cities. Now, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the trend to leave cities and to uh, not believe in cities anymore is a huge concern. And that's really what I meant about believing in, um, there's something about cities that should be believed in and, and that is um, the quality of life. Of course, you know, it's not, a, uh, I wasn't really referring to sizes and uh, minimal sizes of apartments, but the sense of living near each other um, without the fear of contagion. And, you know, in fact, I think it's been scientifically proved that people that live in cities are actually more resilient uh, than people that don't. Um, so, you know, that's really, uh, you know, uh, uh, the only point about that. But I, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I love cities. I'm a believer in cities. I can't imagine myself not living in a city. But I think, you know, there, there are many things that we, are, that we don't know. We don't know what will happen. But I think we may find ourselves with a lot of empty high-rise office blocks in cities as people have learned to work remotely, for, you know, at distance or, or at home. And, and how are we gonna deal with that? And, and how can we use this opportunity, particularly in kind of downtown areas that are totally dead at night, you know, where all the people who, who work there go, go home somewhere else. You know, how, how can we use this opportunity to bring back a kind of, social diversity, but also a mixity of uses and, and functions. Well, this is why you're proposing the, uh, the, the reuse of the department store. So there's a question to you, which uh, from Lucy Mino to you, Amanda, saying regarding the reuse of major retail premises, what social and economic research or citizen consultation inform the interior program shown in your slides. So <laughs> we, we, I know we, the answer. We've not, we've not 
um, we've not got there yet. And, you know, this, this is really the beginning of an idea. And, uh, and it's a good question because to really make it believable um, and real, we do have to have a, you know, we do have to structure the, um, the very nature of the consultation. And not only that, but also, you know, the economic model for it. But I think it's, you know, I, I do think it's important to, to dream and to start somewhere. And from, you know, a very humble beginning, you can um, maybe extract something a little bit more um, meaningful over time. So we have just a few minutes left before I wrap up. And uh, Siglin Weinbrenner from Jerusalem has asked a very simple question, which uh, uh, I'm perhaps going to start with uh, Rosanna and go round and maybe end with Suketo, which is, how can design help overcome politically divided and separated cities, which results in which result in unequal distribution of infrastructure, resources, and green areas? Now, obviously, this is such an all-encompassing question that uh, it may be impossible to answer in a succinct way. But perhaps, Rosanna, if we start by, you know, you clearly showed in your two very concise projects the issue of division. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more localized way than the questioner implies. Do you want to comment on that and then we'll go, go around the Zoom table? Sure, so um, I think that changing this idea of barriers into boundaries and changing the idea of space into place connects, you know, like barriers lock out everyone, they divide, they separate, and uh, when you change them and you open it and you make them more porous as just as simple as changing the vertical for the horizontal, um, or just, you know, like thinking that if you couldn't cross a bridge, you just have to put it up. Like they're very simple things that uh, maybe they were not thought before. And just giving these ideas of, and also believing that small matters it's also important because it doesn't, it, the scale doesn't matter. It's the things that you're changing. And I think that the cities are also changed by the small interventions or acupunctures that once you're adding many of them, you're changing the city. And, um, and so with this idea of boundaries, it also talks about this idea of space experienced by the body and um, that it's informed by the daily life and historical narratives, and then it, how you start adding. And the place is where really people gather and create meaningful relationships. Amanda, do you want to add your thoughts? I mean, I, I, it's a very, very hard question to answer. And I maybe have kind of two answers at a different scale. One, one is that to propose projects that demand that unexpected parties come together and collaborate to effect something and make it um, realizable. And the other is a, a, a smaller scale to, you know, as architects, I think, you know, we're, we're very reactive as a profession. I, I don't think my fellow architects here are at all, but, but as a profession, I think we are. And, and I think we need to be a little more entrepreneurial and, you know, understand what are the unmet needs in the community that we know a little bit about? Identify what those unmet needs are, work with the community, work putting together the framework for a project, raising the funding for it, you know, not just designing, going way, way beyond that. Um, so, you know, at, at a kind of a smaller scale, sort of personal level, that's something that I think, it, you know, we can all make um, a contribution to. But I, I think thinking bigger, you know, just projects that will bring together different, will bring together the politicians, will excite the politicians as much as the community, as much as the developer. Um, and then we get everybody to work together. That's well, Liz, we saw the pictures of um, relatively, um... I don't know whether he was excited or, or, or uh, bemused the president of Russia going through one of your parts. 
But what are your thoughts? Just in 30 seconds, please, and then something. Okay, well, you know, um, guerrilla action is one. Just take over a site, you know, and use it in an interesting way and then see if it takes. Two is um, become citizen activists, uh, expand the agency of architects to actually, like Amanda says, imagine things, convince people, um, show them the benefits, what's in it for them, you know, and um, get people to do the right thing. Um, and, and the last thing is, um, it's really in the end, uh, a matter of policy and, uh, and it's having a seat at the table earning a seat at the table and being able to influence uh, uh, the government. I'm glad to hear that as a, at the LSE, we agree with that. Suketo, last 30 seconds, thank you. Well, great threat to the city before the pandemic was gentrification and the pandemic kind of has stopped that dead in its tracks. Rents are down all over uh, New York. Uh, people are leaving, uh, but not in places like Jackson Heights where they don't have the luxury of having a second home in, the Hudson Valley, Jackson Heights is booming. Uh, I don't think New York is dead. Uh, there's lots of young people now who are able to come into New York. So there's all kinds of opportunities. And you know, in just, just in terms of what architects can do, I think what we what's needed is a re-envisioning of space, both public and private. So midtown office buildings, for example, um, in Bombay where I grew up, no office is ever empty at night because the people who work there often sleep in the office buildings. So what if we reimagined these uh, empty office buildings as uh, hotels or cafes or some sort of gathering places at night after the workers live? We've all used now in the last year to thinking of rethinking of home as office. And what if we think of office as home? I'm going to have to stop you there, but I think uh, these summary comments in response to that very big question do cut across some of the approaches presented today. First of all, there needs to be a genuine understanding of what the social, cultural, economic problem is. Secondly, make the most of what is there. Don't, don't just invent for the sake of it, but also use extraordinary imagination um, and innovation to solve the problems of humanizing the city. Can I thank on behalf of Anna Herhausen and everyone at LSE Cities our four speakers today, and for all of you who've attended from across the world. Thank you very much and hope you join the next session, which will be on mobility and the city, the date to be announced. Thank you all very much.